Hello Europa Universalis players, my name's Raymond, and today I want to talk to you about trade. The trading system is one of the most daunting parts of the game to newcomers because there's so many moving parts. It's easy to get overwhelmed, and I know plenty of people who have dozens of hours in EU4 who only have a rough idea of how it works. However, it's actually pretty simple if broken down into its basic parts. When you do understand it, you can reap in massive piles of cash. You can see here I'm Venice, and my global trade empire provides a whopping 2,803.1 ducats, which is over 80% of my income. Today, I'll explain the mechanics that let me do this. The aim of this guide is to be efficient and thorough. I'll use plenty of examples and explain everything needed to understand the trading system in this one video without wasting your time. Now before I begin, if you get confused, there's a great guide on the wiki. It's spread over several pages, but the info is all there. Also, if you don't care about the nitty gritty math and mechanics, and just want to know strategies for different circumstances, you can fast forward the video to the last section where I cover exactly that. Now, without further ado, let's talk about trade in Europa Universalis 4. To keep things simple, I've set up a custom game with just four nations, named Blue, Purple, Yellow, and White. They're divided amongst three trade nodes, with Blue having its provinces in the Genoa node, Purple in Venice, and Yellow and White in Alexandria. The basic trade system in EU4 can be broken down into four components that I'll talk about in depth. They are trade nodes, trade value, trade power, and merchants. After this, I'll talk about modifiers, the gameplay mechanics that interact with trade, and some strategies and rules of thumb I use to efficiently set up my trade network in-game. So first up, let's talk about trade nodes. Every province has its own associated trade node, and many provinces come together to make one trade node. The trade map mode shown here makes it easy to see which provinces are assigned to which trade nodes. Today we'll be interested in the Venice, Genoa, and Alexandria trade nodes. Each node has lines with arrows slowly moving towards it or away from it. This marks the potential flow of ducats either into or out of each node. For example, the arrows going away from the Alexandria node to the Venice node indicates ducats in the Alexandria node can be sent to the Venice node. We say that Venice is downstream from Alexandria, or that Alexandria is upstream from Venice. The connections between nodes are the basis for all interactions between different nodes. Furthermore, the connections are simple in that they never change. Alexandria will always be upstream from Venice no matter what. Next, we can see that Alexandria is quite a busy node, being downstream from Katsina, Ethiopia, the Gulf of Aden, and Aleppo, and being upstream from Constantinople, Venice, and Genoa. However, for learning purposes today, we'll ignore everything but the connections to Venice and Genoa. Now let's investigate what makes the ducats in each trade node. For each province in the node, at the bottom right you can see what good the province produces along with its price. In Algarbia's case, it's grain which sells for two ducats. Next, at the bottom left you can see a box for trading information in the province. The bottom line shows the goods produced. The base value of this number is the production development of the province multiplied by 0.2. In Algarbia's case, 4 times 0.2 equals 0.8 goods produced. After this, the line above goods produced is the trade value line, which is simply the goods produced line multiplied by the price of the product produced I talked about earlier. So in Algarbia's case, that's the 2 ducat grain times 0.8 goods produced to give a trade value of 1.6. Here's a diagram repeating the math I just said. When you bring up the trade node interface, you can see a panel on the left with the ducat value of things contributing value to the node. If you hover your mouse over this, you can see the breakdown. For Alexandria's case, there are just four provinces. You can see the trade value of all of them, including Algarbia's 1.6 value I showed earlier. The sum of all trade value of the provinces is added together and divided by 12 to get the monthly value. Here's a diagram showing the calculation. All trade value in the entire trading system originates at provinces through this simple calculation. However, you probably noticed the local row isn't the only row contributing to the total value of the node. The incoming and outgoing lines show that money moves between nodes as well. I'll discuss more about this in the next section. The trading system of Europa Universalis III was essentially just the trade value section I discussed earlier. Goods were sent to their node, and you had merchants go out to all the nodes to collect from them. Europa Universalis IV introduced the concept of trade value moving between different nodes. Countries now compete with each other to direct trade to their node and to collect it without it being siphoned off by others. The way they compete is through trade power. 
there are three main sources of trade power. Provinces in the node, provinces in a downstream node, and light ships. First, each province a nation controls gives them trade power in the province's node. This is seen at the bottom left of the province view. The base value is 0.2 of the province's total development. Since Algarbia has a total development of 12, the trade power is 12 times 0.2, which equals 2.4. The sum of all province power for a given country can be seen in the trade node interface, and hovering over this value gives a breakdown of where it comes from. Next up, nations get one-fifth of the provincial trade power of downstream nodes. You probably remember that the Venice node is downstream from the Alexandria node. If we look at the Venice node, we see purple has 64.6 .6 power from provinces there. One-fifth of that provincial trade power gets applied upstream, meaning purple gets 64.6 .6 times 0.2, which equals 12.9 trade power in Alexandria. Next, nations can send light ships on the mission to protect trade in a node to increase their power. Each light ship gives two trade power at the start, and this value increases as you get better light ships through the course of the game. You can see this on the trade node interface. There are two other minor sources of trade power. A nation gets two from their merchant being present, and five from a nation's home node. This leads me to the next section. So far, I've talked about how the nodes are connected, how nodes get their ducats, and the power nations use to compete with each other, but what does this competition become? How do nations convert the trade value of a node into usable ducats in their coffers? Well, that's where merchants come in. Merchants are the envoys sent to different nodes to conduct one of two missions. If they transfer trade power, they use their share of the trade power in the node to push value to another node. For example, in Alexandria we can see purple is transferring power to Venice. The other mission merchants can do is to collect trade. When they do this, they use their trade power to collect a portion of the value of the trade node. This is what finally converts trade node value into actual ducats. You can see yellow and white doing that in Alexandria. Now, I've tried so far to keep modifiers away from the initial discussion as much as possible. However, there is one modifier I absolutely must mention. If you try to collect trade from a node that is not your home node, your trade power is reduced by a massive amount. This modifier is really what gives the trade system its shape. It means you never want to just send all your merchants out to collect trade everywhere. Rather, you want to have one merchant collecting in your home node, and all other merchants directing trade value to that node. You only want to collect from one pot, and you want that pot to be as full as possible. Purple has trade power in Alexandria, but its home node is Venice. Therefore, Purple's best strategy is to use its trade power in Alexandria to push trade value downstream to the Venice node, and then collect from Venice. Now let's see how trade power breaks down between collecting and transferring. This part is a little counterintuitive, but I'll illustrate with a diagram. When seeing where trade power of a node goes, the game actually uses two stages of competition. The first stage is just to see if the value is staying in or leaving the node. First, the sum of all trade power from nations collecting from trade, indicated by the plus in the node interface, is divided by the total trade power in the node to see what portion of the value stays in the node. This is the green portion of the retained trade value pie chart, and hovering over it will show you what nations the power comes from. Then, the sum of nations using their trade power to transfer value forward to any other node, indicated by the green arrow, is divided by the total trade power. This is the rest of the trade power in the node, and represents the red portion of the pie chart. After the value of the node has been divided between either staying in the node or going elsewhere, there is a second stage of competition. This is simple in the case of collecting, where each nation collects retained value in proportion to their trade power as you would expect. The second stage for transferring, however, is a bit different. For nations transferring value, only nations with merchants get to compete for which node the value gets transferred to. It's easier to show this with an example. In Alexandria, purple wants to transfer to Venice and blue wants to transfer to Genoa. If both of them had merchants, this would proceed as you would expect, with the value transferred to each node being proportional to each nation's trading power. However, if blue didn't have a merchant, their power would still be used in deciding if value is transferred or retained at the first stage of competition, but not for where the transferred value goes in the second stage of competition, meaning all the transfer value would be directed towards Venice. And that is the trade system in Europa Universalis 4. Apart from the weirdness of the two levels of competition, it's not all that complicated, especially when broken down into its basic parts. To recap, a province produces some level of goods dependent on its production development, then multiplies this number by the trade price of the good it produces to get the trade value. Then the trade value of all provinces in a node are added together to get the local node value. 
This value is swept into the system where nations compete to maximize their income by directing value to their home node by transferring value into and out of other nodes. All the hundreds of different nations in the game are using the same basic system, making it intricate but not complex. One of the most daunting aspects of the trade system is the amount of modifiers. Europa Universalis loves its modifiers, but again, none of them are that complicated when looked at individually. All of them just fiddle with the values somewhere along the system. To save time, I won't explain the ones that are extremely obvious, like river estuaries, trade companies, or the events that change the price of goods. Also, throughout explaining these, I'll use a simple base case so you can see how changes pan out. In this hypothetical, the Alexandria node has a value of 10 ducats, with blue, purple, yellow, and white all having exactly 20 trade power each. Yellow and white want to collect, and blue and purple both have merchants transferring value to different nodes. Based on the setup, yellow collects 250, white collects 250, purple transfers 250 value to its node in Venice, and blue transfers 250 to its node in Genoa. Our first modifier is trade efficiency. This is a bonus applied post-competition to the final amount of value you are collecting. If we give yellow a plus 100% trade efficiency in our example, it means they will put 5 ducats in their coffers every month. Everything else stays exactly the same. Next up is trade steering. Going back to the example, trade steering is applied only to the second stage of competition when deciding which node to transfer value to. This is easier to see with an example. Let's say purple has plus 100% trade steering. The first stage of competition stays exactly the same. Five ducats are collected and five ducats are sent forward. However, when deciding which node to send them to, the trade steering bonus comes into play. Purple's trade power of 20 gets plus 100% added to it, making the final value 40, meaning 3.33 ducats are sent where purple wants them to Venice and only 1.67 ducats are sent to Genoa. In effect, trade steering doesn't change if value is retained or transferred, it changes where the transferred value is sent. This modifier can be seen when you hover over the button below the ducats shown being transferred. This leads me to the next modifier, which is the multiple merchants bonus. When a merchant transfers value to another node, the post-competition value increases. Multiple merchants from different nations create bigger increase, but there are diminishing returns shown here. Moreover, the increase from each country is multiplied by that country's trade steering value. Here's what happens in our example. And here's an example if Blue, for some reason, decided to transfer value to Venice instead of Genoa. Next up is global trade power. This is just a percent increase to all the trade power a nation has in a node. It's applied at the first stage of competition and carries through to the second. Again, here's an example of Blue suddenly got plus 100% global trade power. There are two other issues I want to talk about. The first is the difference between domestic and foreign trade nodes. If your country controls over 20% of the provincial trade power of a node, or it's your home node, it's classified as domestic, otherwise it's foreign. There are some modifiers in the game that only affect one or the other. Most prominently is that overextension reduces your trade power in foreign nodes only. Finally, there's caravan power or inland bonus. Trade nodes are considered inland nodes if none of the provinces have ports. When you steer to, from, or collect in an inland node, you get extra trade power. The extra power is your total development divided by 3 and capped at 50, although the cap can be raised with bonuses as you can see here. Before we can discuss strategies, there are a few other mechanics in the game we need to get through. The first is transferring trade power from one nation to another. When this happens, another country gets whatever percent of the trade power of the nation transferring has in all its nodes. This can be done diplomatically or forcefully through a peace deal. Protectorates and colonies automatically transfer 50% of their trade power to their overlord, but vassals, client states, and unions do not. Next up are embargoes. An embargo is a diplomatic action from one nation targeting another nation and impacts nodes where both nations have trade power. The defending nation loses a percentage of its power in the shared node equal to half of the percentage the attacking nation controls in the nodes before the embargo. Embargoes are free against rivals but cause a 5% hit to trade efficiency to the attacking nation for anyone else. Finally, there's privateering. This is a special mission for light ships. 
These light ships hoist the Jolly Roger, get a 50% bonus to trade power, and use their trade power to divert value in the node to a temporary pirate nation, reducing the share of value other nations receive. They then send 40% of the value they collect back to the country that commissioned them. By doing this, they act as a way for a nation to collect from trade in an enemy's node without suffering the massive penalty that comes from collecting in a node that's not the home node. Countries that have more than 20% of the trade value before privateering get a trade war cast a spell on countries that send privateers. To counter piracy, nations can have their fleets hunt for pirates, with the effectiveness based on the speed and the amount of guns on the ships sent hunting. Now I'll tell you how to put the trading system into action to rake in the ducats. There's not really any one strategy to be used for trading as a whole, rather I've developed a list of tips and rules of thumb for different parts of the trading system. Tip 1. I already said this, but it bears repeating. You lose a massive portion of your trade power when you collect from a node that isn't your home node. Because of this, 99% of the time you're going to want to be collecting only in your home node and using all your other merchants to direct value there. With that being said, a lot of strategy depends on where your home node is. It starts in your capital, but it can be moved for 200 Diplo points. It's best to place your home node in the node that is the furthest downstream node where you have lots of trade power. Here you can see an example. My nation of Raipur has provinces in the nodes of Bengal, Ceylon, and Goa. My home node is in Bengal, however it's far upstream, so I lose out on the trade for my provinces in Ceylon and Goa. In this setting I make 2.47 ducats per month. The best course of action here is to move my home node to Ceylon. I control 75% of the trade node in that node, and it will allow me to transfer trade from my provinces in Bengal to where I can collect them as well. Now I make 6.06 .06 ducats a month. You can see Goa is downstream of Ceylon, however I don't want to move my home node there because I only control 9% of the trade power there. If I move there, I transfer my trading value into an area where it would be siphoned off by other countries. Hence, the profit maximizing option is to just ignore trade from my provinces in Goa and to simply collect in Ceylon. An extension of this is that end nodes, where value can only enter and cannot exit, are great places to put your home node. These change from patch to patch, but currently they are Venice, Genoa, and the English Channel. The whole point of my Venice game was to use this fact to funnel value from nodes upstream into a home node where value could not escape. Tip 2. Use lightships as the bread and butter of your trading empire. Conquering provinces is hard, while lightships can be built at the press of a button. Their maintenance is low enough that they should always be making a profit if done correctly. The game even has a helpful indicator showing where it's most profitable to send them. Focus on improving your share of trade value in your home node first, then work upstream from there. Tip 3. Construct the right buildings in the right provinces. Marketplaces increase provincial trade power by a percent, which works really well with flat provincial bonuses like estuaries. However, it's wasteful to build marketplaces in nodes where you have an overwhelming amount of trade power. Instead, in those provinces, you should focus on building manufactories, which are expensive but are akin to upgrading the production development of a province by five. They should be invested most heavily in provinces that produce goods that have a high value, which leads me to... Tip 4. Learn which goods have the higher prices, then control those. Price levels change throughout the game, but some goods will always be cheap like grain, wool, and fish, while others will be more expensive. The two areas of the world that have the highest concentration of expensive goods are South Asia, such as in India, Indochina, and Indonesia, and Central America, as in Mexico and the Caribbean. Tip 5. Identify and control important nodes. Node connections have changed in different patches, but at least in 1.19, there are some critical points. The Gulf of Aden is the gateway to Indian trade, and it decides whether that trade is going to the Eastern Mediterranean, or if it's going to get flung around Africa to Western Europe. Likewise, the Ivory Coast is the critical link where all Asian trade picks a Western European node to go to. It can sometimes be worth controlling these even if you don't have Asian colonies. By redirecting trade from the Ivory Coast, you can make your enemies do all the work getting value there, then siphon a good chunk into your own coffers. Tip 6. Send your merchants to the right places. Sending merchants to steer nodes downstream of your home node isn't going to help you because you're not going to be collecting there. Instead, I prioritize the following. First, I send a merchant to my home node because although you collect automatically from your home node, you get 10% more with a merchant there. Then I send my merchants to nodes directly upstream from my home node, prioritizing high value nodes in areas where I have lots of trade power. I then keep working my way upstream from there. I prioritize high value nodes and if I find one where I don't have a lot of power, I'll send some light ships. 
Tip 7. Know the value of long trade chains. You can stack the multiple merchants bonus several times if the value has to go through multiple hops. Each hop adds even more value, and this can spiral upwards pretty quickly. This is primarily what caused the trade income in my Venice game to become so ridiculously high. Tip 8. Always embargo your rivals and nobody else. Embargoes against rivals are free, but those against other nations cost you 5% trade efficiency, which is almost never worth it. You also get power projection from embargoing rivals, so there's no reason not to. Tip 9. Use privateering strategically. You can use lightships either to protect trade or to privateer. I found it's almost always more lucrative to protect trade due to a privateering only giving 40% of the plunder, but piracy still has its uses. If I'm economically more powerful than my foe, and they rely heavily on trade income, it can be seriously damaging to their economy. Even though I might make less, the damage to them can sometimes be worth it. It can also be a good source of power projection. Tip 10. Don't worry about complete optimization. There is a lot of math in this video, but it's just been to show you where the numbers are coming from. I've never whipped out a calculator during a game to see if I could squeeze out just a little bit more income. The effort required to do that is far too great considering the reward, and you'll get 95% of the results if you just exercise basic common sense in regards to trade. So that's my guide to trade in Europa Universalis 4. If you have questions or want something clarified further, be sure to leave a comment. If I get enough comments, I'll do a follow-up FAQ video. My name's Riemann, and until next time, thanks for watching.